Who taught me about sleep apnea? Chuck Perkins. Chuck Perkins got me into sleep. I got into sleep like a maniac through my headache patients, surprisingly enough. So I'm going to just reiterate very quickly the stuff that he said. Why don't doctors know anything about sleep? Because we're all unconscious, that's why. <laughs> doctors are human beings. We're all unconscious while we're sleeping. We concentrate on what happens during the day. Unfortunately, we heal in sleep. All of us know we heal in sleep. The odd part is, my job, help people heal, I don't know anything about sleep. Very weird. So I happened by accident to fall into sleep. Chuck Perkins taught me most of what I know. And then, I'm going to go a little further. My thinking about sleep comes from a neurologist's brain, from a neurologist who thinks about headache all the time. I'm going to give you my view of what I think is making all of our sleep goofed up. And it crosses over most of the areas that he discussed. And you don't need a CPAP mask. That's the best part of all. OK. Because my answer to the Chuck Perkins is, all my patients said the same thing for the six years I was putting those masks on. Dr. Gomanak, it's not normal to wear a mask while you're sleeping at night. I said, yes, you're right. If I had a pill, believe me, I'd be giving it to you. I don't. I hope I live to the point where we actually figure out why this is happening and fix it. And by weird coincidence, I think I figured it out. So one, it happened in my headache patients. They're not fat. They don't have fat necks. And although it's true that when you lay down and you go to sleep, the pharyngeal muscles get relaxed, it's not in all phases of sleep. We get paralyzed in only certain phases. So you can be sleeping on the couch watching a movie flat on your back, you're not snoring until you fall asleep. It's not just being asleep that causes the paralysis to go wrong. It's particular phases of sleep. Now as it gets really bad, they start to have apneic episodes all the time. But in general, we get paralyzed in certain phases of sleep. So here's now a neurologist's mind approaching this from the brain. Why would we get paralyzed in sleep? Why are we doing that? I'm going to give you my explanations of that. And then I'm going to take you where we went with vitamin D eventually. So when I see my patient come back and say, hey, I just wore this stupid CPAP mask for three weeks and my headache went away after I gave her all these medicines that I feel like I know the chemical background that makes the headache better. So my difference is I have this idea chemically what part of the brain are my medicines working in? What do they do? She comes back and this was early on before uh, Dr. Perkins just taught you that it's not really just oxygen. She comes back and she says, you know, my, my, my CPAP has made my headaches better. So I think man, maybe the brain is making some chemical like verapamil or Topamax. Wow, what a concept that would be. Now, she comes back and she also says, oh, my two teenage boys have sleep apnea too. Well, that's pretty weird. Now, the other interesting thing about my practice is I see kids too. I see people from age 5 to age 95. I see little kids who have headaches. They have sleep disorders too. That's kind of creepy. Why does everybody here, everybody in this room, 90% of you have a sleep disorder? That's creepy. That means it's a societal change that's happened probably in the last 30 to 50 years. It is not normal to have normal sleep. And I'm going to teach you about what I think normal sleep is, why it's abnormal now. Here's my grandbaby who gets to play a role in it. So I want to reiterate, these are my ideas. These are hypotheses. I'm going to give you a lot of ideas about how to think about it. Most of the journal articles have not come yet. That's going to come in the next 10 years. This reiterates what Dr. Perkins just told you. I think that we do light sleep because we're waiting for a safe place to get paralyzed. When you fall asleep right there, as I'm talking to you, you get paralyzed immediately, you fall out of the chair, you break your neck. Very bad thing. We actually get drowsy. We think drowsiness is just, oh, beginning of sleep. It's not. It's a specific state. It tells you that sleep is coming. Really important, because then it gives you a warning. And you can do things, slap yourself in the face, get up, walk around. There are people that you and I know that the cardiologists see, actually, for abrupt loss of consciousness. They just fell asleep without drowsiness. You can stretch out your sleep disorder to the point where your sleep switch is no longer normal at all. So some of the people who get sent to me for possible seizure they're walking down the street and they fall asleep. We think because drowsiness isn't there before, 
Oh, they had a loss of consciousness, must be a seizure. No, you can screw up the sleep phases so much that you can fall into deep sleep without drowsiness. When you think about it that way, and you think about each one of these as being, oh, very well-designed system so that we're warned, you can also think about it in this way. So I, I actually think about sleep more like as an engineer, let's say. Let's say we observe these things. Oh, we get paralyzed in sleep. Well, why do we get paralyzed in sleep? Well, I don't know, but if you were going to design a system so that everybody had to get paralyzed in sleep, all animals, not just humans, what would be the difficulties with that? That's one of the things we're going to talk about. So, light sleep, we're sleeping. That means you can sleep for 10 hours and not do any of the work. You can be in light sleep the entire time. That means you saying, oh, I slept fine, but I feel tired, real significant. It's not so much how much time you spent unconscious. It's what you feel like and how many pills you have to take in the morning that measures how good your sleep was. So, sl slow wave sleep that Dr. Perkins referred to, one of the most important things that happened to me after my patients started to come back and say, hey, you know what, not only is my headache patient but better, but my back pain's better, I started saying, well, you know, I saw this guy yesterday. I was doing this EMG on him. He has this terrible back pain, four surgeries. He wakes up every hour. He, stays, he wakes up every hour because his back hurts. I wonder if he has a sleep disorder. Sure enough, he has terrible sleep apnea. You put a CPAP mask on that guy, one month later, he wakes up with no pain. This guy's been five years with the pain experts. That means the ability of sleep to cure our body is a million times stronger than my medicines. Our lack of understanding of it is absurd. It is where we all heal our body. The CPAP mask, very important. It's not a drug. It teaches you all sorts of things because you're not given a drug, yet the patients get better. So I go to this lecture. This woman comes at the end, Eve Van Kouten. She does endocrinology of sleep. At the very end of this three days at the Bellagio, which is why, of course, I went, and I was very happy to be there, and I was learning all this stuff, she says, you know, my lab just published the fact that growth hormone is released in slow-wave sleep in a pulsatile way in slow-wave sleep. And I think, wow, maybe that's why that guy with the back pain, all of a sudden his back pain's better. You know, maybe the growth hormone's acting like a repair hormone. It turns out our children grow in slow-wave sleep while they're paralyzed. They don't grow while they're running across the basketball court. Think about everything that has to happen while they're growing. Both legs have to grow at the same rate. Both arms have to grow at the same rate. They have to have multiple guys there, muscle guys, the guys who are responsible for the arteries, for the tendons, for the nerves. They all have to be present together as a crew to elongate the limbs. Very specially controlled situation, run by growth hormone, while you're paralyzed in slow wave sleep. What if you think about that pulsatile release of growth hormone as being the same or an analogous thing happening in adults? Kind of gives you a way of explaining the healing process during slow wave sleep. And there are some specific articles about pain, body pain, being related to lack of slow wave sleep. So I picture that phase as being, and this is very oversimplified, okay? There are, there are articles that show we do repair in other phases, but just as a general idea of what we do during these paralysis phases. The next important phase has a lot to do with my daily headache sufferers, rapid eye movement sleep. We get the very most paralyzed at all in rapid eye movement sleep. Why would that be? We're all sleeping under a bush somewhere, you start to talk during your dream, the lions come and eat all of us. We were essentially small mammals lurking about with great big animals that could jump on us and eat us. That means while we're paralyzed and vulnerable, we have to be completely paralyzed so we don't give away our hiding place. If you start to sleepwalk and you're out in the normal environment, uh-oh, your kid just walked off a cliff. Your kid just got eaten by the lions. We don't see well at night. We are, by definition, up during the day. That means we want to hide away at night. You don't make noise. It's fatal to snore. It's fatal to talk during sleep. These are things that when we have now changed our environment so much that we can get up and go pee three times every night, nobody thinks that's weird anymore. If you had to get up and go to the bathroom and you were living out in the wild, you got eaten. It was not normal to get up and go to the bathroom several times at night. Our entire population now thinks it's normal. We have indoor plumbing, everybody has a bathroom right there. You ask, I spend my whole day asking people, well, how's your sleep? Well, I get up three times, go to the bathroom, it's fine, it's normal. 
so it turns out when you don't get into these phases and stay there just like dr perkins just taught you things start to go bad all my patients with daily headache have the same three complaints i can't remember anything i'm in a bad mood and i have a daily headache the daily headache doesn't have to be there you don't have the migraine gene you won't have the daily headache you don't get into REM sleep and stay there for the right period of time you're going to be in a bad mood and you're not going to be able to remember things so here's what happened to me i've got all these young healthy females teenagers at first lots of them have sleep apnea but it's mild and then lots of them don't have sleep apnea what do i do now dr perkins is the one that pointed out to me that most of my young healthy females have REM related apnea so after about two years i realized wait a minute they just told me there was no significant apnea on this gal she's just as tired and cranky as the other ones and he points out to me well you might like to know that even though she doesn't stop breathing a lot she only gets into REM sleep for a half an hour from 4 a.m. to 4.30, and during that half an hour, she stops breathing eight times. So my other pulmonologists are sending reports saying, oh, eight times, eight hours, once an hour, not significant. Well, wait a minute, you missed the point there. If the rest of us do, you know, I don't know, two hours of REM sleep, and she has a half an hour, it's that interrupted, that might be significant. We don't know why it's happening, but I'd still like to know it. Now then, what, what do I do? What do I do to treat that? I have sleep medicines. Great. I spent six years using CPAP, giving sleep medicines. None of the sleep medicines give back normal sleep. Not true completely. There is one drug that gives back REM sleep, the date rape drug. Like, I'm really going to give that to my 35-year-old with three kids. No, I don't think so. Now, I don't think that we should not use it. I just think, gee, how come I don't have a pill to make this better? How come nobody's writing about why this is happening? And now I'm doing sleep studies in all of my patients. Anybody who'll let me, I send them off for a sleep study. I got people coming back saying blah, blah, blah is gone. I don't even have met, third year, woman comes back. My, well, how's that Lyrica treating your burning in your feet? She's had burning in her feet for five years. I'm her third neurologist. I'm not using it. Oh, well, your still feet are still gonna be burning. No, they're not, they're not burning. Oh. What's your internist do? Nothing. You sent me for that stupid sleep study. I'm wearing that stupid mask thing. Two months into it, my burning is gone. I think, what? Your burning is gone? You, you know, you have that gene for diabetes and burning. Your nerves are dying. No, they're not dying. They're turning on inappropriately. And you know what? She put on the CPAP device and it went away. That is a fascinating thing. The doctors who have not gone through six years of watching what happens to the patient when you successfully improve their sleep have no idea what I'm babbling about with this vitamin D stuff. I don't care about vitamins one bit. I care about sleep. Sleep is the cure. Now the next part is, let's try to figure out why it's going bad and what can we do about it. Because I do migraine all day long, I'm very focused on this area. This little stripe right here is what turns on inappropriately in migraine. Migraine has always been there. Human beings think it's normal to have a headache. That's pretty weird when you think about it. It's the only part of the body that we don't go to our doctor for. We go to the pharmacy, we pick up a medicine, we take it. We think that headache is normal. I know that a lot because I spend all my day saying, what about the littler headaches? It's the only part of the body that we think, oh, it's not weird for the pain system to switch on. That's strange. This little wire goes all the way down the spinal cord. Now, we have all these genes for migraine now. As soon as they came out in the 1990s, I'm wondering, well, if these genes that make this thing switch on are in that stripe, how come the bottom half doesn't turn on? That doesn't make sense to me. Maybe the top half of the stripe is in a funny environment that puts it at a higher risk for switching on when no one hit you in the head. Headache is really switching on of a system that's only supposed to turn on when you bonk somebody in the head. It turns on spontaneously, okay? I'm focused on this area. I'm focused on the fact that this turns on all the time in normal humans. How come? So it turns out, once I get into this sleep stuff, that a lot of the things that control our sleep are right next to that little stripe. They're not in it, but they're right next to it. There are two, area, two things that happen in the little stripe in what's called the periaqueductal gray, this little stripe where the fluid drains out, the gray matter of the cord right, and the brainstem right around it. There are two things that happen there. One, we get paralyzed there. And when Chuck first told me that we got most paralyzed of all in REM sleep, I went back to the original anatomic books about where do, we, where do we get paralyzed from? How do they know that? These cat experiments, they put little wires in there and they buzz that part and they kill it. They tell you exactly where it is in the brainstem. Actually, it's in three parts. It's in one nucleus has three parts. Obviously, the diaphragm of the chest still needs to move while we're sleeping. 
This part, called the bulbar muscles, is also split out by itself. So everything else gets perfectly, completely okay. paralyzed. This part, uh-oh, a little bit of a problem there. You get completely paralyzed there, you're going to not swallow and you're going to drown. So there's some special issues about this area. So when I started looking into the anatomy of that, the other thing I find over time is there are pacemaker cells in this area. This happens to come out of the Parkinson's disease literature.